Chapter 28 The Reproductive System The reproductive system is the only system that is not technically essential to the life of the individual. It does, however, affect other systems in the body. And we're going to look in this chapter at male and, re and female reproductive organs, how they produce reproductive cells that will eventually combine to form new individuals. And we'll also talk about the hormones that are very important in the maintenance of normal sexual function. So this video is going to be part one that's going to cover the male reproductive system. And then we will have a follow-up part two on the female reproductive system. Let's look at first at the reproductive system in general. So it's going to ensure the continued existence of the human species. The reproductive structures involved are the gonads, which is a general term for organs that produce gametes. Gametes are reproductive cells like the egg and the sperm, and also hormones. There are ducts involved that will transport the gametes, accessory glands that will create fluids that are secreted into the ducts, and perennial structures collectively known as the external genitalia. The reproductive tract is going to include any chamber or passageway that will connect the ducts to the exterior or outside of the body. Male and female reproductive systems are functionally different. The female produces one gamete per month or releases one gamete per month, and we'll get more specific about that in part two. It will retain and nurture the zygote, and the male will produce large quantities of gametes, about a half a billion sperm every day. The male reproductive system is going to consist of the male gonads, which are specifically the testes. They will secrete male sex hormones, which are known as androgens, and produce male gametes, which are known as sperm. The female reproductive system is going to have the female gonads, known as ovaries, that will release one immature gamete, also known as an oocyte, per month. We produce hormones here. And then we've got the uterine tubes, also known as fallopian tubes, that will carry the oocyte to the uterus. If the sperm reaches this immature gamete, fertilization will begin. And then the oocyte will mature into what's called an ovum. The uterus will enclose and support the developing embryo. And the vagina or vaginal canal will connect the uterus with the exterior or outside of the body. So again, we will revisit this when we get to part two, going over the female. So let's kind of delve more into the male reproductive system specifically. So there is a pathway of sperm from production to release. And here are the high points of that. So we've got the testes, then the epididymis, ductus deferens, ejaculatory duct, and the urethra. I'm going to break that down a little further for you, and then I'll show you pictures of where all this is happening so we can see the traveling of um, sperm from production to release. We're going to have some accessory glands that will produce fluids that are emptied into the duct system. So this is going to include seminal glands, also known as seminal vesicles, prostate, and the bulbo-urethral glands. So I know this is like a little cheesy, but it works. Um, there is an easier way to remember the pathway of sperm from production to release, and it is by using 7-Up. Okay, so 7-Up, we're going to take 
each of those letters in 7-Up and allow them to stand for something that will help us to remember the pathway of sperm from production to release. So let's start with the S. The S stands for seminiferous tubules. Seminiferous tubules we haven't really seen yet. I'm going to show you a picture of those in a bit, but they are crammed here in the testes. So these are tightly coiled little tubes that are inside of each testy. The seminiferous tubules are where the sperm cells are actually made. So we're going to start there. Once they're produced in the seminiferous tubules, they will then move into the E for epididymis. Epididymis. So because there are two testes, that means there would also be two of the epididymi. So this is the epididymis right here. It's kind of comma shaped on the back or posterior surface of the testy. So there's the epididymis. So the sperm will move from the seminiferous tubules to the epididymis, then to the V vas deferens. Now this book that I'm using um, is going to use ductus deferens instead of vas deferens. So I've included that in the parentheses here. Um, it does depend on the book which one you see. But of course vas fits into our cute little seven up. So vas deferens, and because there are two testes, there will also be two vas deferens. So the vas or ductus deferens is this long tube, so follow my arrow here, this long tube that goes up on top of the bladder and around the back of the bladder. And once it goes around the back of the bladder, the vas deferens will empty into the next E, which is the ejaculatory duct. So here's the ejaculatory duct right here, and it runs right through this round thing, which is the prostate. And we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. So ejaculatory duct, then in, that's just a placeholder, so you know, smiley face. And then we move on to the up part. So the up is U for urethra. So the urethra is a long tube that begins here and extends all the way through the center of the penis and out. So P is for penis. So urethra, then out through the penis. So you can see we've taken a big loop around and this seems kind of convoluted, but it's actually really necessary because it takes a while for the sperm cells to mature. So we're going to see them go through different phases as they head through the reproductive tract. And we will get into those details towards the end of this video. So that's the pathway we're going to see. The testes hang in the scrotum. So the scrotum is a fleshy pouch that encloses the testes and they suspend inferior to the perineum, anterior to the anus, and posterior to the base of the penis. So looking at this image a little bit larger, we can see the same structures we've already looked at, but also here would be the scrotal sac that encloses the testes. This is a view of the accessory glands, which we haven't really talked about yet, but I will go ahead and mention them to you now since we are seeing them. Um, this is the seminal gland, and there is a pair of these as well, um, also known as seminal vesicles on the back of the bladder. We have the prostate, which we previously mentioned, and then this is the bulbo-urethral gland. And the bulbo-urethral gland is also a pair. So we'll have two of those as well. Spermatic cords are going to extend between the abdominopelvic cavity and the testes. And we'll look at a picture of this in just a second. It's going to consist of layers of fascia and also muscle. 
And what this does is it encloses the ductus deferens, remember that's the vas deferens, blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatic vessels of the testes. Each of these cords is going to begin at the entrance to the inguinal canal, which is the passageway through the abdominal musculature, and descend into the scrotum. So let's see that in an image here. All right, so spermatic cord is boxed off here, and it is going to include the nerve, the artery, the ductus or vas deferens, which is this peach colored tube. We've got a network of blood vessels, a plexus here, and an artery. So all of that together is considered the spermatic cord. And it moves through the inguinal canal. So that's that opening through the musculature. So that opening through the musculature will allow the spermatic cord to move down and attach into the scrotal cavity with the testes. Okay, and this picture is going to help us with um, talking about a few of the muscles and the membranes involved in the testes. So we'll come back to that image in a bit. So the scrotum is divided into two chambers by the raphe of the scrotum. And this is a raised thickening in the scrotal surface. Each testy lies in a separate scrotal cavity. Okay, so we can see, I believe, here we go, the, um, the wrinkling in the scrotal um, sac is, is what we call the raphe of the scrotum. And it represents, this middle part here represents the two chambers. So there's a chamber here, and then there would be a chamber on the other side to divide the testes. The tunica vaginalis is a serous membrane, and if you remember back from anatomy one, serous membranes are membranes that produce um, serous fluid. And this is going to line the scrotal cavity, which will reduce friction between the opposing surfaces. And just like in most other chapters when we've talked about serous membranes, there will be a parietal, which is an outer layer, and a visceral, which is an inner layer. So I'm going to jump ahead a little to show you a particular image that will give us a good view of the tunica vaginalis. So what you're looking at here is a transverse section through the scrotal sac. And you can see that we've got one testy here and one testy here. And starting on the outside, this would be the skin, of course, and we're moving inward towards the testy, which is here. And what I want you to notice is the tunica vaginalis. So the tunica vaginalis is this white membrane that is lining the scrotal cavity. So scrotal cavity is a space that the testes are in. So here's the space I'm pointing to here and the tunica vaginalis lining the scrotal cavity. That would be the parietal layer. And then it comes around, as you can see right here, and covers the testy as well. So what the arrow is on right now, this would be considered the visceral layer of the tunica vaginalis. And both of these produce fluid. So this will reduce friction in the cavity which is important. Okay, so that's the tunica vaginalis. We're going to go now to the, to the musculature, and we'll be able to see that in this image, but also back in the previous image that we were looking at. So let's start with the dardos muscle. So the dardos muscle is a layer of smooth muscle, and remember what that means. Smooth muscle is involuntary, so this is not under our conscious control. Um, it is a layer of smooth muscle in the dermis of the scrotum. So this is within the skin, technically. And its job is to cause the characteristic wrinkling of the scrotal surface. Now the primary reason for this is the wrinkling bunches up extra skin. When there is an erection, that extra skin is used in the erection. 
When the erection goes down, that extra skin is bunched up in the wrinkling process by the dardos. The cremaster muscle is a layer of skeletal muscle that is deep to the dermis. So this means it's below the dermis. And its job is to tense the scrotum and pull the testes closer to the body, which can happen because of sexual arousal or decreased temperature. So how does the cremaster help in temperature regulation? So let's look at that now, and then we'll look at an image of both of those muscles. So temp temperature regulation in the testes is very important for normal sperm development. Sperm require temperatures of 1.1 degrees Celsius lower than body temperature. If the sperm become overheated, this can damage them and lower sperm count. So the muscles of the cremaster muscle will relax or contract to move the testes away or toward the body. So if it's very, very cold, then the cremaster muscle will move the testes towards the body to keep them warmer. And if it's very, very warm, the testes will move away from the body so that they don't overheat. And what this does, again, is maintain acceptable testicular temperatures, all for the protection of sperm development. So going back to this picture, we can see very clearly um, the dardos muscle and cremaster. So here's the scrotal skin, and we said that the dardos muscle was a part of the dermis. So that's going to be right under the skin here and part of the skin. The dardos muscle, that's the one responsible for wrinkling. And then this that covers the testy, this is the cremaster muscle, the one that helps to regulate temperature. Okay, so moving a little bit deeper towards the actual testy, we have the tunica albuginea. The tunica albuginea is deeper than the tunica vaginalis that we already looked at. It's made up of connective tissue, very high in collagen, so this makes it very elastic, and it's continuous with fibers surrounding the epididymis. These fibers will form septa or dividers that will converge near the entrance to the epididymis. This will support blood and lymphatic vessels of the testes and the efferent ductules. So if none of that made sense, that's okay, because we really haven't looked at it. So let's go forward to that image we looked at before and see what the heck we're talking about. So remember the tunica vaginalis was covering the testi and also lining the scrotal sac itself. Well, underneath the tunica vaginalis, you can see is another membrane that is also white in color in this image. And that is the tunica albuginea. So it's actually covering the testi directly. And it goes around the testi, but also notice that it appears to also penetrate inward. So if you follow that, it penetrates inward and we see it happening here as well and here. Those are called septa. Septa is to divide. So septa testi, these are divisions or walls in the testi, sort of like the segments of an orange. It divides them into segments and each of these segments each of these triangular segments is called a lobule, a lobule. So each of the wedges is a lobule, and those are created by the septa. Now, inside of each lobule is the seminiferous tubules. Now, that was the S in 7-Up, um, that very first letter, seminiferous tubules. And that's what these tightly coiled purple squiggly tubes are in this illustration are seminiferous tubules okay and that's labeled right here seminiferous tubules are very important because this is where the sperm begin this is where they're made in these tightly coiled little tubes so let's talk about them a little bit 
the septa subdivide the testes into lobules. We just talked about that. And the lobules will contain about 800 slender and tightly coiled seminiferous tubules. This is where sperm production happens, so super important. Each is about 80 centimeters long. And if we stretch each one out in one testy, it makes about a half a mile. These connect to the reedy testy, which is a network of interconnected straight tubules. And then efferent ductules connect the reed testy or the reedy testy to the epididymis. Okay, so let's see what in the world that means. So here are our seminiferous tubules. And you can see that they transition into this area right here. Okay, and that area right here is the reedy testy. So here we go. It's labeled over here. And once the sperm move from the seminiferous tubule into the reedy testy, we will then head through the efferent ductules, which are these straight little tubes leaving here into the epididymis. Remember, epididymis is the first E in 7-up, okay? So seminiferous tubule, the reedy testy, efferent ductules into the epididymis. Areolar tissue fills the space between the tubules. Now that's something we talked about in Anatomy 1 in Chapter 4. Um, areolar tissue, you can kind of think of it a bit like a packing tissue. It fills, fills spaces, and it's a loose connective tissue. Within those spaces, there are also going to be blood vessels, interstitial endocrine cells, also known as Leydig cells, and they produce the hormones. Androgens the dominant male sex hormones, testosterone being the most important one of the group. So this is a cross-section through a seminiferous tubule. And what I want you to notice, and we're actually going to come back to revisit this later, towards the end of this video, um, but this represents the wall of the seminiferous tubule. Remember those 800 tightly coiled tubes? And this is the lumen. Reminder that a lumen is a hollow inside of something. So this is a hollow space. And inside the wall of the seminiferous tubules, look at all that cell division going on. These are sperm being produced. And the closer we get to the lumen, the more mature the sperm become until they break off enter the lumen, and then they begin moving on to the next phase of 7-Up. So we're going to come back to this and see how the sperm are produced and how they end up in the lumen. Testes produce immobile sperm. So when the sperm are first made, they can't move, which means they're not ready. We, we can't fertilize without some kind of movement. So they are, are not yet capable of fertilizing an oocyte. Other parts of the reproductive system are going to be responsible for helping those sperm to mature, nourish them, store them, and then transport them. The immobile sperm from the testes are moved on by cilia, remember the little hair-like projections that sweep things across the cell surface, their cilia lining the efferent ductules that we looked at that will help to sweep these immobile sperm into the epididymis. So let's go on to the epididymis. So we looked at the seminiferous tubules and then remember we move on to the E which is the epididymis. This is the official start of the male reproductive tract. It's a coiled tube about seven meters long. Wow, that's long. It's bound to the posterior border of each testy and it has regions. It has a head, body, and tail. The head is the largest part of the epididymis. It will receive the sperm from the efferent ductules. The body on the posterior surface of the testy 
and then the tail begins near the inferior border of the testy, and it will connect with the ductus deferens. This is the primary storage location for the sperm. So here's a great picture to show the parts of the epididymis. So the epididymis, remember, is comma-shaped on the back of the testy. Here is its head region, body region, and tail region. And right at the tail, you can see that it attaches to the V in 7-Up, which is the vas or ductus deferens. So here comes the vas or ductus deferens going up here. So just as a review, remember that this is the tunica albuginea. Remember that it divides the testy into these segments called lobules by the septa. The lobules contain the seminiferous tubules, which is where sperm are produced. The sperm move into the reedy testy through the efferent ductules into the epididymis, where there is a head, body, tail, and then we move into the V, vas or ductus deferens. So here's an actual image, a little harder to see, but the testy there, head of the epididymis, body of the epididymis, and tail of the epididymis, and then we see the ductus deferens moving up. So the functions of the epididymis are to monitor and adjust the composition of fluid produced by the seminiferous tubules. They will also recycle damaged sperm and store and protect sperm and facilitate their functional maturation. So the sperm spend a bit of time in the epididymis and during this time they're able to start to mature. So moving on to the ductus or vas deferens. This is part of the spermatic cord we talked about towards the beginning. It begins at the tail of the epididymis and goes through the inguinal canal, curves inferiorly along the urinary bladder toward the prostate and seminal glands. The lumen, remember that means the hollow inside, will enlarge into an ampulla of the ductus deferens. And to me this looks like a swollen part of the ductus deferens. The wall is a thick layer of smooth muscle here, which I think will be important in contracting to move fluid through. So we're going to look at this as well in a picture because it's a lot easier to, easier to understand if we can see it. So hang on one second for that. The ductus deferens is lined by pseudo-stratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Now I'm secretly hoping that you're just totally aware of what all that is from learning it in chapter 4 of Anatomy 1, but in case you're rusty, pseudostratified means not truly stratified. So it looks stratified, but it really isn't. It also has cilia on it, we know what that means, and the epithelial cells are columnar in shape, which means they're rectangular. Peristaltic contractions will propel the sperm and the fluid forward. The ductus can store sperm for several months in an inactive state with low metabolic rates. The male urethra is used by urinary and reproductive systems. It's going to extend 18 to 20 centimeters from the bladder to the tip of the penis and is divided into three regions. We have the prostatic urethra, the membranous urethra, and the spongy urethra. Okay, so let's look at the accessory glands, and then we're going to go back and tie in all these things we've just introduced using images. So the accessory glands are going to produce the fluid component of semen, 
which is a mixture of secretions, and each one has distinctive characteristics. The important glands that we're going to go over are seminal glands, also known as seminal vesicles, prostate, and bulbourethral glands. Okay, so let's take a look. Now, what we're looking at here is this is the back or posterior surface of the urinary bladder. Okay, so here's the male bladder, and then we've got a ureter going up to the kidneys here, a ureter going up to the kidneys here, and then here is our pair of ductus or vas deferens. Okay, you can see them moving through here, moving through here, and remember we said that towards the end of the vas or ductus deferens, they are going to enlarge, forming what's called the ampulla of the ductus deferens, which is labeled here. So they become enlarged, and then they converge and empty into one tube. You can see they're coming together and emptying into one tube, which is called the ejaculatory duct. So the ejac ejaculatory duct is short, and it is the second E in 7-Up. Okay, so the ejaculatory duct, which empties into the urethra. So now we're, we're into the word up in our 7-Up, U for urethra. Now I want to point out um, the glands here that we mentioned, the accessory glands. So on the left and right of the ductus deferens, we have our seminal glands, also known as seminal vesicles. And I'll tell you what they secrete in just a minute. But you can see that they empty into this same converged area in the ejaculatory duct. Around the urethra, is the prostate gland. So here's part of the prostate, there's the other part of the prostate, which also releases fluid. That is a component of semen, the fluid part of ejaculate. And then below we have two bulbo-urethral glands on the left and right sides of the urethra. Okay, so we're about to transition into what do all these glands make and how are these fluids helpful? But I want to go way back to the original male reproductive picture to show you the divisions of the urethra. So the urethra, we said, was in three sections. We have the prostatic urethra, which is, of course, within the prostate. We have the membranous urethra, which begins on the outside of the prostate and extends to the penis. And then once we are inside of the actual penis, there is the spongy urethra. The spongy urethra. Okay, so those are our three regions of the urethra, which will bring us to talking about the accessory glands and what they actually make. So let's um, talk about them in general first. So the major functions of the accessory glands are to activate the sperm, provide the nutrients the sperm need for movement, propel the sperm and the fluids along the reproductive tract by peristaltic contractions, and produce buffers to counteract the acidity of the urethra and the vaginal environments. So seminal glands first. These are tubular glands. They're coiled and folded, and they're very active. Um, An estimation is they make about 60% of semen volume. The ejaculatory duct is the short passageway we looked at. It starts at the junction or union of the ampulla of the ductus deferens and the duct of the seminal gland. We looked at that too. It penetrates the wall of the prostate and empties into the prostatic urethra. The prostate is a small muscular organ that encircles the proximal portion of the urethra below the bladder. It's going to produce prostatic fluid, which is slightly acidic. It forms about 25% of the semen volume. 
and is ejected into the prostatic urethra by peristalsis. Prostatitis is prostatic inflammation, and it can occur at any age, but it's more common in older men. Bulbourethral glands are also compound and tubular mucus glands. They're round, we looked at them in the picture, and they're very small, about 10 millimeters in diameter, located at the base of the penis, and they secrete a thick alkaline mucus. This is what's referred to as pre-ejaculatory fluid. So this is actually secreted before ejaculation. And what it does is it coats the urethra and lubricates the tip of the penis. When it coats the urethra, it does so with an alkaline or basic mucus. What this does is it neutralizes urinary acids. So remember in men, the urethra is shared with both the reproductive tract and the urinary system. So urine could have just moved through the urethra. So this alkaline mucus will coat the urethra, neutralizing the urinary acids so that when the sperm follow in ejaculation, they will not be damaged by the urinary acids. The duct of each gland will travel alongside the spongy urethra and empty into the urethral lumen. Semen, or ejaculate, is um, the typical ejaculation will release 2 to 5 milliliters of fluid. A very low volume could indicate problems with the prostate or seminal glands. Sperm count is taken of semen collected after 36 hours of sexual abstinence. What's considered normal range would be between 20 and 100 million sperm per milliliter. Seminal fluid is the same concentration as blood plasma um, or osmotic concentration as blood plasma but a different composition. High concentrations of fructose, which of course is sugar, is easily metabolized by the sperm. So this fructose is going to are going to power the sperm to move so that they're able to whip their flagella. Prostaglandin in seminal fluid is going to stimulate smooth muscle in the male and female reproductive tracts. Now what that will do is cause spasms to force more semen out of the urethra in the male and once the prostaglandin in the semen reaches the female vaginal canal, it too will cause her vaginal canal to contract, pulling more semen in. Um, and the idea of that, of course, is to maximize the odds of pregnancy. Fibrinogen is also in seminal fluid. And what it does is once the seminal fluid enters the vaginal canal, fibrinogen will form a temporary semen clot in the vagina. So it will cause the semen to thicken up so that more of it will stay in the vaginal canal long enough to allow the sperm passage through the cervix. Again, trying to increase the odds of possible fertilization. So overall, the secretions of seminal glands are slightly alkaline, and the idea of this is to neutralize acids in the prostate and vaginal canals. The vaginal canal is acidic, and by the sperm being coated in this alkaline or basic semen, this is going to protect them as they move through the acidic vaginal canal, again, increasing odds at fertilization. Semen contains sperm, seminal fluid, and enzymes. The penis is a tubular organ through which the distal portion of the urethra passes. It conducts urine to the exterior of the body and introduces semen into the female's vagina. The root of the penis is a fixed portion that attaches the penis to the body wall. The attachment will occur inferior to the pubic symphysis, and we'll take a look at this in a picture as well. The body of the penis, also known as the shaft, is tubular, movable portion of the penis, and the glands penis, also known as the head, 
is the expanded distal end of the penis that surrounds the external urethral orifice, or the opening to the urethra for urine, and also ejaculation. So here is the um, oscoxa, or the, the pelvic bone, and there's the pubic symphysis, where the two pelvic bones, or two oscoxa, join with a disc of fibrocartilage. Um, and you can see the bulb of the penis, or the very end of the penis here, and also the, um, these tubular structures, which we are getting ready to talk about in just a second. So we'll actually come back to this um, image shortly. This represents the body or shaft of the penis, and then the head of the penis, also known as the glands penis, and the opening to the urethra is called the external urethral orifice. The dermis of the penis contains a layer of smooth muscle, a continuation of the dardos that we talked about earlier, um, underlying areolar tissue which allows the skin to move freely because remember the penis does change with an erection so the skin needs to be able to move freely. Subcutaneous layer contains superficial arteries veins, and also lymphatic vessels. Erectile tissue is in the body of the penis and is located deeper than the areolar tissue. It is made of a network of vascular channels. The vascular channels are separated by partitions of elastic connective tissue and smooth muscle fibers. So when the penis is in a in a resting state the arterial branches are constricted the muscular partitions are tense and blood flow into the erectile tissue is restricted however during an erection the penis stiffens and elevates to an upright position there are two types of erectile tissue. We have the corpora cavernosa, of which there are two. These are two cylindrical masses of erectile tissue under the anterior surface of a flaccid penis, separated by a thin septum and enclosed by dense collagen. They diverge at their bases, forming the crust of the penis, and each crust is bound to the ramus of the ischium and pubis, so by, by tough connective tissue ligaments. The erectile tissue will surround a central artery. So let's go back and um, visualize this. So in purple here, these are the corpora cavernosa, which are masses of erectile tissue. When there is an erection, these masses of tissue engorge with blood. Notice that the corpora cavernosa extend back into a right and left crust. We can't see that in this image, though. Um, so here's the right one, and it attaches to the ramus of the ischium, which is, again, the pelvic bone. Okay, and then we have the other mass of erectile tissue called the corpus spongiosum, and it is going to surround the urethra. It extends to the tip of the penis and expands to form the glans penis. It's surrounded by a sheath with more elastic fibers, and the erectile tissue contains a pair of small arteries. So if we go back to that picture, um, I want to point out the spongiosum. So you can't see it as well, but this is the spongiosum in red. And so there's one of those, and it surrounds the urethra. So moving forward to a different view. So just reviewing, we have the bladder. There's the prostate. Here is the prostatic urethra. Here are the bulbo-urethral glands. And then here we can see on the uh, left and right, we have the corpora cavernosa in purple, there and there, and then underneath that we have the corpus spongiosum, and the corpus spongiosum surrounds the urethra, and you can see the urethra running right through it. So let's look at this 
in a cross section like this one. Okay, so here we have the skin, dardos muscle, and moving deeper at the top we have in purple, this is our corpora cavernosa erectile tissue, and you can see these chambers that will fill with blood when there's an erection. Um, deep artery in each mass of erectile tissue. And below, we have the corpus spongiosum, which surrounds the urethra. So the last big topic is spermatogenesis, or the formation of sperm, um, and also the hormones involved. So spermatogenesis is the process of sperm production, begins at puberty, and continues past the age of 70. The complete process takes about 64 days and involves three steps, mitosis, meiosis, and spermiogenesis. The cells of spermatogenesis are going to include spermatogonia, which are stem cells. Stem cells divide by mitosis to produce daughter cells. One will remain a spermatogonium, or stem cell, the second will differentiate into what's called a primary spermatocyte. Primary spermatocytes begin meiosis and form secondary spermatocytes. Secondary spermatocytes will differentiate into spermatids. Spermatids are immature gametes and they will eventually differentiate into sperm. Sperm will lose contact with the wall of the seminiferous tubule and enter the fluid in the lumen of the seminiferous tubule. So we're going to review this using an image as well, but keep in mind that spermatogenesis happens in the wall of the seminiferous tubule like we talked about earlier. The contents of the seminiferous tubules are spermatogonia, spermatocytes at various stages of meiosis, spermatids, sperm, and large nurse cells to help out with the process. So here's an image of the seminiferous tubule and there's the lumen. Remember that's the inside of the tube and you can see that there's a lot of activity going on in the wall of the seminiferous tubules. Um, on the very outer surface we have the spermatogonia. These do not look like sperm at all, um, but these are the stem cells that produce the spermatocytes, okay? So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna zoom in on a wedge of this image so that we can see it a little bit more closely. Okay, so here are the spermatogonia, which remember are the stem cells that produce the primary spermatocytes. Okay, so stem cells, spermatogonia, will divide to produce primary spermatocytes, which are these. Primary spermatocytes begin meiosis and become secondary spermatocytes. Again, don't look like sperm yet. Secondary spermatocytes become spermatids. You see how we're moving closer to the lumen as we go and become more mature? Spermatids still don't look like sperm. The spermatids will become sperm. These do look like sperm. So what happens between here and here? Well, the answer is spermiogenesis. So we had spermatogenesis, which is the production of the sperm, and now the changes that happen between spermatid and sperm is called spermiogenesis. So let's talk about spermiogenesis. So here's our spermatid, and it has to look like this. And this one's not quite ready yet either. Um, it's going to turn into this. So how do we go from here to here? Well, the answer is spermiogenesis. And spermiogenesis takes about 24 days. And what's happening in spermiogenesis is the spermatid will shed excess cytoplasm and begin developing a flagella or flagellum, if we're talking about one, 
Um, and in the process of shedding this cytoplasm, we are going to shed all organelles that are not helpful to a sperm's life. So we're shedding, we're shedding, we're shedding until we are left with this, a mature sperm. So the sperm is left with a head. The head contains DNA in a nucleus. And it's going to be half the complement of a human. So humans have 46 chromosomes, right? So that means we've got the equivalent of 23 in here. So we've got a head with DNA. We have a neck piece or middle piece. And the neck or middle piece contains mitochondria, which is super important because, you know, they make energy. And they're going to make energy from that fructose in the seminal fluid. Um, and so once they have metabolized that fructose and produce ATP, then that tail, the flagellum, can whip accordingly, propelling the sperm forward. Spermiogenesis is the last step of spermatogenesis. Each spermatid matures into one sperm. And as we saw, this involves structural changes to the spermatid. Um, the sperm in spermiation will lose attachment to its nurse cell and enter the lumen of the seminiferous tubule. The nurse cells play a very important role in spermatogenesis. They help to maintain the blood testy barrier. They support mitosis and meiosis. They support spermiogenesis, secrete inhibin, and secrete androgen binding protein, or ABP. So let's look at some of these points separately. The blood testy barrier is going to isolate the seminiferous tubules from general circulation. This is good because it protects them. The nurse cells maintain this barrier they're joined by tight junctions that divide seminiferous tubules into compartments. The outer compartment contains spermatogonia, and the inner compartment is where meiosis and spermiogenesis occur. They support mitosis and meiosis um, because they are stimulated by follicle-stimulating hormone, or FSH, and testosterone. The stimulated nurse cells will promote the division of spermatogonia in the first place and the meiotic divisions of spermatocytes. The nurse cells will surround and enfold the spermatids, giving them nutrients and chemical stimuli for development, and they will engulf or phagocytize the cytoplasm that those spermatids shed off while they are developing. Nurse cells also secrete inhibin, which is a hormone, and it does this in response to factors released by the sperm. Inhibin will depress the production of FSH and perhaps the hypothalamic secretion of gonadotropin-releasing hormone. The regulation of FSH and gonadotropin-releasing hormone will allow negative feedback control of spermatogenesis. In other words, as rates of sperm production increase, the secretion of inhibin increases. Because if there's a lot of sperm being produced, then inhibin will kind of quiet down sperm production so that we don't go overboard. Nurse cells also secrete androgen binding protein, or ABP. This will bind androgens, specifically testosterone, in the luminal fluid of the seminiferous tubules. This is important because it will elevate androgen concentration, which stimulates spermiogenesis. In other words, keeping everything going. The production of ABP is stimulated by follicle-stimulating hormone, or FSH. The sperm that leave the epididymis are mature, but they're not mobile. To become modal, which means actively swimming, and fully functional, the sperm must undergo capacitation. 
there's two steps in this. One, sperm become modal when they're mixed with secretions of the seminal glands. Remember, we've got to give them some fructose so that they can begin producing energy. Sperm become capable of fertilization when they're exposed to the female reproductive tract. The anatomy of sperm, as we already looked at, includes a head, neck, middle piece, and tail. The head, as we saw, has a flattened um, appearance and it's going to contain the nucleus with chromosomes and, as we said, half the human complement. Also on the head is a very important little, I don't know, I kind of look, look at it a bit like a little helmet for the sperm, which is probably a terrible thing, but it, it works for me. Um, it's a membranous compartment at the tip of the head. And it contains enzymes that are really important to fertilization. And we'll touch on that more when we get to chapter 29. But these enzymes will help the sperm to penetrate the egg when it comes time. The middle piece is attached to the head by a short neck and contains mitochondria that are arranged in a spiral around these protein tubes. They will provide my, the ATP to move the tail. And the tail is the only flagellum in the human body. It's whip-like, but it moves in a very complex corkscrew motion. So mature sperm, remember how we shed off that cytoplasm, um, which included some of the unnecessary organelles? Mature sperm lack an endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi, lysosomes, peroxisomes, and inclusions. The loss of organelles reduces the size and mass of the sperm, which is good because the sperm need to move quickly and efficiently carrying that DNA. That's their main focus. So all those extra organelles are just dead weight. The sperm must absorb nutrients like fructose from the surrounding fluid. So hormones, we mentioned some of these already. Um, the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland releases follicle-stimulating hormone, FSH, and luteinizing hormone, or LH, in response to gonadotropin-releasing hormone. So gonadotropin-releasing hormone is made in the hypothalamus and is carried to the pituitary by the portal system or a network of blood vessels. This will control the rate of secretion of FSH and LH, as well as testosterone. FSH and testosterone will directly target the nurse cells in the seminiferous tubules, causing them to secrete inhibin, secrete androgen binding protein, and also possibly promote spermatogenesis and spermiogenesis. As we talked about before, inhibin will inhibit FSH production in the pituitary gland and perhaps suppress the secretion of gonadotropin-releasing hormone in the hypothalamus. Faster rates of sperm production will cause more inhibin to be secreted, which we mentioned before. Luteinizing hormone will target interstitial endocrine cells of the testes and induces secretion of testosterone and other androgens. Testosterone is huge in the male reproductive system. It plays a big role in male sexual function. It functions like other steroid hormones where it circulates in the bloodstream bound to one of two types of transport proteins. It is able to diffuse across the target cell membrane and bind to receptors in the cell. The hormone receptor complex binds to DNA in the nucleus, and what will happen is it can stimulate spermatogenesis, maintain libido, and it will stimulate bone and muscle growth, establish and maintain male secondary sex characteristics, and also keep the accessory glands and organs functional and healthy. All right, so we will pick up in part two the female reproductive system next time. Thank you and see you soon. Mm -hmm.